We will now proceed with the award lectures. Professor Sawamura, if you could please introduce our first award lecture. Okay. Oh, thank you again. Oh, I'm uh, happy again to be a chair of the Akira Suzuki Award uh, lecture by Professor Stefan Bakbar. Uh, I've already, uh, I already introduced uh, in detail Professor Bakbar, and now I should skip it, uh, skip the introduction this time, and uh, better to leave the time for, uh, keep the time for the Professor Bakbar's wonderful lecture. It's fun time now. Uh, the big title of the, his lecture is Paradigm Catalyzed Carbon Heteroatom Bond Forming Reaction for the functionalization of molecules, big and small. Professor Bakbar, are you ready? Yes. Okay, please. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Messiah, again. And again, it's a phenomenal uh, honor to be the uh, inaugural recipient of the uh, Akira Suzuki Award. And this is a picture of Professor Suzuki that I took uh, about uh, <clears throat> two and a half years ago in Shanghai when I was fortunate enough to be able to sit next to him uh, at, at, at a dinner. I'd also like to echo the very eloquent comments of Professor Wales about how important it is for us to uh, not lose our international interactions and collaborations as a way to foster um, good feelings among people from various nations, despite what our governments might wish to, uh, to do on their own. Okay, so today what I'm gonna tell you about is uh, sort of, uh, I'll start off and talk about the history of um, palladium catalyzed CN bond formation, talk about some of our uh, recent results in small molecule chemistry before moving on to the functionalization of big molecules. So that's the introduction, which we're gonna skip here. Um, so here's the reaction. Uh, this is certainly analogous to the famous Suzuki reaction, but now with a heteroatom nucleophile. And we all learned in introductory organic chemistry that substitution reactions at sp2 hybridized carbons is, are, are very slow, except in special cases of electron deficient systems, um, unless you have a catalyst. And so that is what we uh, strove to do. I should first point out that there no one person or group um, makes this kind of, uh, ha has made this possible. It's been uh, many, many people and uh, contributors, some of whom are very famous, like uh, Professor Hartwig at Berkeley now, who's made many, many important contributions, both to the mechanism, mechanistic study and the synthetic work, but also those who are less well-known, but equally important, uh, Professors Kosugi and Megida, who uh, reported the first palladium catalyzed CN coupling with amino stannanes, and then it's very fitting that Toso is sponsoring this award because um, I remember visiting Toso in, in Yokaichi City, I believe, and, and doctors Koi Nishiyama and Yamamoto described to me their work on tributyl phosphine for uh, palladium catalyzed CN coupling. And this was actually the first work uh, where this was used as a ligand in cross coupling reactions. Okay, in my own group, um, the way things happened were, was not necessarily, I'm gonna try to hide this floating panel. Yeah, there we, no, that's not what I wanted to do. Let's see, hide, uh, floating, okay, there we go. All right, um, in my own group, what happened was um, I got tenure at MIT, essentially making um, zirconosine complexes of strained molecules and always looking for things we could do with those. Um, we figured out that we had a good way to make three, four disubstituted indole derivatives. 
And I was alerted to the existence of a series of natural, interesting natural products that were for amino indoles. So I, um, I think quite logically thought it would be interesting to be able to convert the iodide to the amine. I asked a new graduate student to, uh, to, to try this. This was in 1989. He went to the library because we didn't have computers to do the searching at that point and came back and said it had already been done by Magida and Kosugi. And he had found this paper uh, in the literature. It was a very interesting paper. It had some it clearly showed that the chemistry could work, but it only um, re reported the synthesis of diethyl anilines, which was not clear um, at the time. Now, it, it turns out that um, that first worker could not reproduce the paper, the work in the paper. Uh, I had a second person who couldn't. And then finally, Dr. Neil Gurham uh, came in and he was able to, it, it worked exactly as it was described by Megida and Kosugi. And the, the, the key, at least for us, was to distill the, uh, the tributyl stanol amine, which was not a whole lot of fun. And then Anil figured out, based on some uh, 1960s main group metal chemistry literature, that if you put in an, an, any heavier amine than diethyl uh, amine and mix it together with that, that one distilled stanning, that you could in situ make uh, essentially any other amino stanning and get the coupling to work. So this was great. And we published our first paper. This was the first synthetic paper um, since the Magida and Kosugi paper in 1983, published in Jackson 1984. There were still problems with the reaction and, and lots of things we didn't understand. The reaction was stoichiometric in tin. That is problematic. Um, it worked well. But only aryl bromides gave good yields, which was very strange considering reactions like Suzuki coupling, uh, iodides were really good substrates. So that, that wasn't very good. So we decided we needed to figure out how to get rid of the tin. And at that time, I wrote a proposal to the US National Institutes of Health to see if I could get the work funded. And the scientists who reviewed it said it was very uh, in, an important problem but they said uh, it would be very difficult to actually get rid of the tin. Uh, nonetheless, um, um, they, they did like the proposal. Unfortunately, the proposal wasn't funded for bureaucratic reasons. And we went on with a lot less money to try to do the work. Anil Gurham um, was a remar or is a remarkable chemist and he was able to figure out um, how to do the chemistry without the presence of tin. And the key was using this strong base sodium t-butoxide, um, which works uh, for reasons we still don't fully understand much better than potassium t-butoxide. Okay, so we published, we, got, we were very excited. We got our first results. We submitted a paper. In fact, the editor of Angavanta Kami at that time, Peter, Peter Golitz, uh, essentially asked us to submit a paper, which we did. And um, one of the referees didn't think it was a very important paper. How important do you consider the results reported? Less important. Do you recommend acceptance of the communication? No. Uh, they said the chemistry was novel, but not of high interest or importance. Fortunately, the editor uh, overruled this referee and so the paper got in. Okay, so now uh, Anil Gurham got a job and he had left MIT. And so I had uh, now just new graduate students to work on the, on the project. Okay, and normally this would be very troubling. I was very fortunate that those new graduate students were exceptional. And now I had to figure out something for them to do. So here is the, uh, the generic catalytic cycle for the reaction. We take some pre, some palladium containing material, which we'll call a precatalyst, and add a ligand. And then somehow you go from, if you start at palladium two, you get reduced to palladium zero. We understand that pretty well at this point. 
Again, it's liganded by um, one through four ligands. It then undergoes an oxidative addition. This binds an amine and there's a recognition event when it binds the amine. It also greatly acidifies this hydrogen. You get uh, deprotonation, dehydrohalogenation, and then reductive elimination to regenerate your catalyst and to form the product. Normally, um, in, or in most cases, the uh, binding deprotonation event is rate limiting, uh, particularly if one uses a weaker base. And sometimes you need to use a weaker base because of functional group compatibility issues. And, and that is not due to the palladium, that is in fact due to the combination of the base and the amine. Okay, and so again, I had four new, four first year graduate students I had to come up with projects for. And so for one of them, I said, well, maybe we could um, look at the, essentially the molecular recognition between a chiral palladium species uh, using a, an asymmetric ligand and, and a, a racemic chiral amine to do a kinetic resolution. Okay, and so that's the project that um, uh, Sybil Waga, who's now the head of process chemistry at AbbVie, worked on. And um, I remember uh, coming down to the lab and Sybil telling me, well, the reaction, even with the famous uh, Noyori Binap, did not give a very good uh, EE, only 10% EE. And I said, oh, well, you know, sometimes you know, many of my ideas are not so good. And then she said, but the chemistry works much, much better. And so the original chemistry, which used uh, triarothotolophosphine, uh, now with BINAP, and we quickly found we could use racemic BINAP, uh, worked much better. So we had a reaction go from 5% to 79%. All of a sudden we could do this uh, at, with fairly low quantities, 0.05 mole percent of palladium in high yield, um, and then things that didn't work at all, again, um, started to work. So that was great. Um, and this work was also carried out by John Wolf, now a professor at the University of Michigan. So I had, even though they were young students, they were exceptional students. Now, what didn't work still were reactions with acyclic secondary amines. And that turned out to be uh, fortunate for us because it meant we looked for newer ligands to go on. and Dave Old came to my group as a postdoc from Larry Overman's group. And we had the naive idea that maybe if we made the, uh, the BINAP smaller, uh, okay, and we take off the blue and we go to this biphenyl uh, bisphosphine that things might be better. And so Dave tried this reaction, which is a terrible reaction with BINAP. And I, again, remember coming into the lab and, um, asked him how it was going. And he said, well, it's not very good. The yield is really low and it's, it's a very slow reaction. But instead of stopping, he turned the heat up just a little bit, um, came back the next day and all of a sudden the reaction was much better. And at the end, the yield was quite good and much better than we had ever seen with this, these sorts of ligands. And so we, we figured that, uh, we reasoned that what is happening was that the catalyst was changing. And so the most obvious thing was we were getting phosphine oxidation. So Dave quickly made the monophosphine oxide and the bisphosphine oxide. The monophosphine oxide gave fantastic results. We were very excited, but it was a pain in the neck to make. And so our hypothesis was this phosphine binds well, and this one is a very weak binder. So it's a hemilabile binder. And we thought, well, we can replace that with a dimethyl amino group. Now, the original synthesis of these ligands was, was not very much fun. And so we did, figured if we're going to do this anyway, let's put in something with more electron density. And so we made it a dicyclohexyl phosphine. And that was our first ligand, which is called DAFOS, in honor of David Old. And that really changed everything. So now what, what this allowed to happen was chemistry of aryl chlorides. Okay, Previously, only bromides and triflates um, could work. Now aryl chlorides could work. Um, and, and not only in these reactions, the amination reactions, but also in Suzuki coupling reactions, 
we, th which was developed at the same time with my friend and then colleague, Professor Greg Fu. Okay, why does this matter? Well, aryl chlorides are much more widely available than bromides and triflates and much less expensive than bromides and triflates. Okay, it also uh, allowed the chemistry uh, with bromides to occur at room temperature. So what's going on here? We have a very, very large ligand. Um, and in fact, one ligand will surround, like the Hulk, the palladium, like this. And um, in fact, two ligands can't very happily bind. They can bind reversibly, but, but it, it, it's, it's very happy to have L1. Okay, and it turns out that all of the fundamental steps in cross coupling are faster with L1 coupling. The other thing is, is that it's big enough that uh, you don't get decomposition events, which you normally see by swapping groups on two different palladium centers. Okay, and when you have one big ligand, it's actually much smaller than two medium sized ligands, like two triphenylphosphines, and that means there's enough room for the substrate to get in close, close. And then the key is making sure that the uh, ligand doesn't dissociate. So you gotta have something that sticks to the palladium well enough that you don't get palladium black formation. And now there are a whole series of ligands. Joe Fox, now a professor at the University of Delaware was the person who came up with a, a really good synthesis of the ligands, which is still what is, what is used. There are about 20 of these that are commercially available. Most of the ligands are named after the people who first uh, made them. John Foss was after John Wolf, X Foss after Showa Wong, Brett Foss after Brett Fors, and there are a few that are named after uh, cats. Rue Foss was named after my cat, Rufus. Okay, all these ligands are crystalline air stable solids. Um, we've made probably a thousand ones. Metric tons have been sold. And if you buy them from one of our uh, licensees, and they're about to go off patent anyway, but if you buy them from one of our licensees, there, there are no additional royalties required. So we had eventually gotten funded by the National Institutes of Health, and we were very excited. We had published 40 papers, mostly in JAX and on Gavanta, and we had developed some uh, complementary copper chemistry and we went to re renew our grant proposed our grant, and we were very confident. And came back, and were surprised that the uh, grant was not funded. And what they uh, what the uh, <clears throat> reviewers said was the problem is that little in general applicability will be uncovered, and there will only be a modest contribution to basic science. Fundamentally, new discoveries are unlikely. And then they went on to say that this work was process development work better suited uh, to be supported by the industrial sector. And they recommended that I be more diligent in expanding my efforts toward a wider audience and to more generally useful goals. Okay, well, with that in mind, we completely ignored uh, their suggestions and continued on. And just to uh, show you something that makes me very happy, here are uh, six examples from 2021 and 2022 of complicated molecules used, made using uh, not only our methods, but also uh, the ligands of, that we developed. Okay, this is not for manufacturing. These are compounds that were made um, in drug discovery as part of the drug discovery uh, efforts. Chemistry can be done on a either large or small scale. It's been done um, in the microgram scale, ultra high throughput screening at, at Merck, pioneered by Spencer Dreyer. So that's in 1,384 well plates. Um, the ligands have been made in uh, at least 50 kilo batches. This is T-butyl, this is 50 kilos of T-butyl breath boss, which is one of the harder ligands um, to make. Okay, well, one thing that I have benefited greatly from is interacting with people in industry and uh, because they'll try your chemistry on much harder substrates than you can readily access uh, oftentimes. Uh, and one thing that we found was that um, there were many instances where the chemistry should have worked, but in fact uh, it didn't. And that was because the, catalytic, the, the catalyst was never forming. 
Okay. And so uh, Mark Bisco, now a professor at CUNY in, in New York City, came up with the idea of the pre-catalyst, which was essentially, let's make what is analogous to the intermediate in the catalytic cycle. And just to remind you, we form an L palladium zero, which does an oxidative addition of an aryl halide and then binds an amine. So we put those all together. In the presence of base, they, it quickly goes, in this case, to indolin plus L palladium zero. That first uh, generation uh, was worked really well but it required three steps to make. And there was a moderately unstable intermediate. And I think Aldrich was making it on a hundred gram scale. And then Yang Zhang now at BMS came up with a way and Nick Bruno uh, came up with, a, with an improved way to make this where you essentially shake palladium acetate and two amino biphenyl and then do manipulations. Okay, and that included, um, you can also use uh, the N-methyl two amino biphenyl uh, as well, okay. And then for the very largest ligands, we use this compound, which is an oxidative addition comp compound. It's got a, a mass carboxylic acid, so it makes it very easy to uh, remove the byproduct in the reaction. In 2016, there was a paper from uh, chemists at AstraZeneca, and they reported that, uh, and they were surveying the reactions that were in uh, JMED Chem the most common 20 reactions. And they found that in the previous 20 years, only two reactions, both palladium catalyzed reactions had made the top 20. Of course, amide bond formation is, is top. And now um, here's Suzuki coupling. You can see um, the, how that this is almost as good as amide, which is really remarkable. And then palladium catalyzed CN was the other new reaction. So we were very excited by that. However, there were also problems. Um, Spencer Dreyer had done a survey of the electronic notebooks at Merck and it found that uh, for in over 2000 reactions of very highly functionalized drug leads, over half of them failed to deliver product at all. Now, to me, that's not so bad. I look at the half glass full. That means that almost half of these worked in very complicated situations. But of course, we would like everything to work and like it to work the first time. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And so um, I had a student, a uh, brilliant student, Pedro Arachia, now at um, um, IBM. And he was uh, very interested in studying how reactions um, end, right? So what causes catalyst death? And so he um, had done some very interesting kinetic work. And after he left, um, Scott McCann, who's now at Merck Process, and Elaine Reichert, who's a fourth year student in my group, um, were charged with uh, carrying on this work. And the idea was, you know, why can't we have a catalyst that goes on forever, right? And so we decided to have some, you know, simpler goals. We wanted to understand why we were getting decomposition, but we set goals. We would we wanted reactions at room temperature. We wanted them to be less than an hour, moderately low catalyst loading, so less than half a mole percent, very broad substrate scope. And, and, and importantly, we wanted to make them more relevant for industrially important um, substrates. So uh, heterocycles with sp2 hybridized nitrogens, which can be problematic in some cases. Why, why do we care about room temperature? Well, reactions are easier to set up, particularly for high throughput screening. Um, most cases, but not always, reactions that work well at room temperature will work even better when you heat them. And we know that all of the fundamental steps occur at room temperature, okay? And so we went through and, and looked at the different properties that affected the stability of the catalysts. The first thing from Shoa Wong was putting in ortho substituents. The next thing from Brett Foss was putting substituents on the top ring. And then from Espen Olson, a bigger group on the top ring. And what this big group did is um, cause the orientation to have the palladium be over the bottom ring. And that is in fact, both for palladium zero and palladium two, where it's most stable. 
Okay. Now, what Pedro and Scott had postulated was a problem was the ligand can be knocked off. And the ligand can be knocked off in the case of sp2 nitrogens or in the case of primary amines. And, and these were the putative off cycle species. And here's an experiment um, that Scott did. We knew that Brett Foss could, cap could catalyze this reaction at 0.01 mole percent um, in an hour and be essentially quantitative. But at room temperature, that's at 110 degrees. At room temperature, the reaction went about 20% and stopped, okay? And so that was curious to us. And then when we looked at the phosphorus NMR, we saw no uh, signals for any palladium um, bound to uh, a phosphine, just free ligand. What was really interesting was when we took that same reaction mixture and heated it to 90 degrees after an hour, the reaction went to completion. Okay, so the catalyst, which will die, gets a new life upon heating. Okay, and in fact, we were able to isolate this previously putative off cycle intermediate and mix it with the ligand and heat it up and show that it gives us an active catalyst. So, what we decided to do was we were thinking about a couple of a couple of issues. One is how does the amine bind to the palladium? And normally the palladium swings away from the bottom ring so it can bind because otherwise you've got three isopropyls that are blocking uh, the approach of the amine to the palladium. But when you have a bigger group here, this is locked. And so we thought maybe removing this uh, bottom isopropyl might be beneficial. And we'll see in just a second how that goes. And so um, Scott made a series of ligands. It turns out, so Brett Foss had two substituents on this ring, EFOS didn't. It turns out having two substituents is, is better. <clears throat> here's, here's the chemistry with uh, Brett Foss or EFOS. And now here's the chemistry with our new ligand, which we'll call GFOS. And it's a little bit better than the one um, that is R equals isopropyl, okay, as you can see. Um, but it is when you compare it over the over a, a series of different substrates, it becomes significantly better. And it's named GFOS in honor of Anil Gurum, who was the person who first got this chemistry um, to work. And it's now commercially available, as are the precatalysts. Okay, so we started to look at things that had previously been challenging, as reported in the literature. Uh, we were able to couple this electron deficient amine. Previously, it required um, 100 degrees for three hours. Now we can do it in an hour at room temperature of 0.2%. Um, two amino <clears throat> pyridine um, is a good ligand for palladium two. Previously, 4% palladium, 80 degrees. Now 0.3% palladium, 94 degrees, one hour versus 24 hours. Okay. Electron poor anilines oftentimes are also very uh, challenging. 3% room temperature, 24 hours. Now 0.2%, um, one hour, 95% yield. Hindered systems, our own work, 2% palladium, 120 degrees, 24 hours, not such a good yield. Now relatively high amount of, pl of palladium, but an hour and 90% yield. Okay. And then we could show that in pharmaceutically relevant compounds, particularly this bottom one, which is related to, um, to Cigna, which is a this next generation Gleevec compound from Novartis, that even though there are many, many basic nitrogens, the chemistry still uh, was good. Okay, so this is the, the, this was work done by Pedro, Elaine, and Scott. And now I'll move on to the chemistry of big molecules. And the idea here, um, and this was, I should say, started by Alex Bocoini, now uh, an associate professor at UCLA, uh, he did about five reactions. Most of it was done by Chi Zhang, who's a postdoc in optogenetics at MIT, and Katya Vinogradova, who's now an assistant professor at Rockefeller in chemical immunology. And it's all done in collaboration with my brilliant colleague, Brad Pentaludi. And the idea here is we're going to take biomolecules with every naturally occurring 
uh, functional group and be able to do selective reactions on cysteines in this particular um, cartoon. And um, we're going to make uh, um, very strong sulfur to carbon bonds that aren't going to fall apart, which has been a problem with some other methods. Now, it turns out there are a lot of things that make this challenging. Um, you have to do this under very dilute conditions, so low micromolar conditions, and it's got to be fast, okay, under, you know, room temperature up to 37 degrees, um, neutral pH. You need complete chemoselectivity because there's certainly no chromatography. You want to have a broad substrate scope um, and you want to have stable products. Okay, so the key here is again, uh, these oxidative addition complexes. And it turns out these oxidative addition complexes are incredibly stable compounds. You can put them in a bottle um, in the air and they last essentially forever. You can even um, purify them by reverse phase chromatography and 0.1% TFA. So um, Katya started to look at the chemistry initially with the triflate, but the halides are just the same with a deca peptide, peptide containing a cysteine and quickly found that these reactions are really fast. They're done in um, five minutes at room temperature. In fact, they can be done in 30 seconds at four degrees. And they operate in, in a pH range, which is broader than most thiol reacting uh, reagents. So you can uh, use pH between 5.5 and 8.5 and get essentially the same results. And one needs only a very small amount in our initial chemistry of water. And now we don't need, uh, uh, sorry, of uh, organic solvent. And now we don't need any organic solvent at all. And so we were able to show in our first paper that we could, um, take these storable reagents, put on affinity tags or bioconjugation handles or fluorescent tags and a number of other um, different groups. And so this was a uh, chemistry where we were making um, <clears throat> small molecule protein modifications. And so we wondered about macromolecular coupling. So could we put two proteins together? Um, there are of course, ways to do this, the most famous is click chemistry. The drawback of click chemistry is that you need to have both of the proteins, if you're going to ligate two proteins, be modified with unnatural amino acids. Um, for thiol maleamide, which is very commonly employed, you need one modified protein. Uh, the, the drawback is that the products that are formed are not particularly stable and you get retromycal addition or oxidations uh, occurring. But note that this is about 200, and 200 plus times faster than the click reaction. And then we'll show you that in our case, we're able to make stable um, bonds. And these reactions are probably three to four times faster even than the Um, So like a thousand times faster than uh, click chemistry, which gives us an opportunity we're taking advantage of. There's been some brilliant work in related work from Ben Davis at Oxford, who showed that when you use a lot of palladium, the protein denatures, and you need to um, remove the palladium and refold the protein. So that was going to be a challenge, right? We don't want to denature our proteins. And we also know that basic um, compounds or constituents like a histidine, in this case a benzimidazole, can slow down the rate of palladium reactions. So again, in a cartoon fashion, this is what we want to do. We want to have a protein with an oxidative addition complex on it. And I'm gonna talk about two different methods um, that we used. The first method actually um, relies on a reagent, a second generation reagent. The first generation came from um, Koji Kobora, who's now a um, associate professor in uh, Hokkaido University in chemistry and Professor Ito's group. And the idea here is that we're gonna make a reagent which is a bis electrophile, okay? And so in, in this case, we have an NH ester, NHS ester. In this case, we have a palladium, okay? And if we take a protein such as ribonuclease, which is free uh, lysines, 
we can isolate it in a one-to-one -one ratio. It's not specific for any given lysine, but it does go in a one-to-one -one ratio. And we can make that ribonuclease with a pendate oxidative addition complex. And here's the material, which we isolated completely stable species. It's stable in solution at pH eight. You can see after three days, we see essentially no um, problems with stability. This was work done by Ivan Buslov. And then we wanted to see you know, what happens to the uh, biological activity. And you do see you lose about a little less than half the biological activity, but that's without any sort of tweaking things around. So we thought that was pretty good and gave us um, the belief that this could go on and be useful. Uh, we looked at taking this palladium oxidative addition complex of a protein and reacting it with another protein and here you can see that the coupling can go uh, and be fast at micromolar concentrations in 45 minutes and even down to nanomolar concentrations, although the reaction now takes 12 hours. This reaction, as I said, is very fast. If we compete first at pH 3, um, we, we make the lysozyme uh, compound with the oxidative addition complex and also with the corresponding malayamid, do a competition reaction. We only see palladium thiol coupling, no malayamid coupling. If we do it at pH 8, which is better for the malayamid, we still see that the palladium coupling is three to four times faster than the malayamid coupling. We can um, use antibodies as nucleophiles. So you uh, break the, the disulfide bonds with TCEP and then treat it with the the protein containing oxidative addition complex to link, um, to make an antibody protein conjugate. And you can turn this around, you can use the lysines on the antibody and uh, react by isolation. Um, and now here we, we put in a, a large peptide to do a peptide antibody uh, conjugate. Okay, so that's the first way. The second way uh, relies on this um, uh, very interesting reaction that we found that has an, an analog in polymer chemistry. And that is, if you make the oxidative addition compound from paradiodobenzene, then what happens is after the first coupling occurs, the palladium zero bounces back or rebounds and does a second oxidative addition. And now you can add a second nucleophile. And if you do that under the right conditions, and particularly if you use this sulfonated S-phos derivative, then the reaction works quite well. So here we take protective antigen with a single uh, cysteine engineered in by site-directed mutagenesis, treat it with this reagent. Here's the intermediate, which we don't see. And what we isolate is the uh, oxidative addition complex, again, attached to the protein. And then we can take um, this protein and react it with another cysteine-containing protein to form protein-protein ligated compounds. Okay. And then um, finally, we were able to extend this to chemoselective reactions of oligonucleotides. Okay. So if we take an oligonucleotide um, which has a free primary amine. Um, at the end, we can treat this again with this oxidative addition complex. In this case, the key is to use this bisulfonated ligand, which really enhances the water solubility. Um, we make this oligo, oligo with the palladium reagent on it, and then we can trap that with a variety of different species. Um, here's the material, um, again, isolable, bench stable. You can put, this is in the air nice fluffy solid after lyophilization. Everything is done. Um, Brad Penaludi's group are experts in mass specs using uh, Orbitrap and other sorts of technology. So we can do sequencing and things like that quite readily. Um, and in this case, uh, we were able to take systems with probes, do a coupling to the oligonucleotides and make a series of compounds as shown. 
So we were able to put in affinity probes, um, solubilizing reagents, fluorophores, photoreactive reagents, and uh, sulfurated DNA into the system. Okay, uh, we can also uh, take um, a protein and conjugate it. So now we're making oligonucleotide protein uh, bioconjugates, and these these occur uh, very uh, rapidly, so 30 minutes at room temperature. Um, and the yields are quite high as determined by LCMS. Okay, so um, what I've tried to do um, this morning in Cambridge, this afternoon in the other Cambridge, and this evening in Hokkaido is to tell you about how the chemistry was discovered. It was really, uh, we had a great incentive and a fantastic role model by our Hiro Akira Suzuki about how to make reactions be fundament, both fundamentally important and practically important. Um, the work and the success is due entirely to the uh, hard work and creativity and intelligence of my coworkers, graduate students, and, and, and postdocs who were, uh, whose pictures I showed on the slides. And the work has been funded mostly by the United States National Institutes of Health with, with some additional kind uh, donations from Merck, Sigma Aldrich, Strem, Johnson Matthey, and Nippon Chemical. And I would like to particularly thank um, Brad Pentaludi and his group. Uh, we have a, an ongoing wonderful collaboration that has been, um, been very exciting. And again, I'd like to thank um, ICRED, Hokkaido University, uh, the Toso Corporation, and the members of the selection committee of this uh, first Akira Suzuki Award. And I'm, I'm very, very grateful and very honored um, to be the recipient. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Very, very exciting talk. Thank you very much. It was so exciting to know how you found the problems in chemistry and how you, uh, your group was uh, careful to solve the problems extending the chemistry from small molecules to even bigger molecules. It's very, very nice and impressive. Much, a very much uh, educational thing. Thank you very much. And although this is a award lecture, special lecture, but uh, we may probably accept. I mean, Steve can accept a few questions from the audience. Okay. Maybe from the hall or from the online. Okay. We, have a, we have a question from the most famous person in the audience. <laughs> Maybe also, how can I operate? Oh, okay. Yeah, please. <laughs> can I can I say something? Please. Yes, go ahead. I, I just wanted to congratulate you, Steve, for for this really well deserved award. I couldn't think of anybody more um, deserving, and and I think your work is really amazing. And I don't have a question. I just also wanted to comment on my very first paper. I was lucky the first two referees were, were really positive and then the editor wanted to decide and after his decision came a third referee report came in and, and this referee also said no it should not be published it's not important <laughs> so you're in, in reasonable company here yeah. <laughs> anyway right. thank you, you very much awesome work see you in august okay next Dr. Mita, why don't you ask your question? Maybe. maybe um, okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you for your uh, wonderful lecture and congratulations to the first recipient and Akira Suzuki Award. So, and I, I have a, one question for the scientific part. So, I think when using your designed bulky diaryl phosphine as a ligand and the reductive elimination is a ready determining step, but Still, deprotonation amine is a later determining step using the disparity phosphine diphosphine ligand. Yeah, so um, the re uh, mostly it's the deprotonation, mm -hmm. binding deprotonation. Re it's reductive elimination 
for uh, certain heterocycles and for triarial amines. Mm -hmm. But other than that, um, it, it, it's not reductive elimination. So reductive elimination is fairly fast. If you go to other groups like CO bond formation or CF bond formation, mm -hmm. then it's always reductive elimination being rate limiting. Oh, really? Uh, that, yeah. the amines case, the reductive elimination very first. Well, it's it's mm. mostly, again, yeah. it's not, there's, you can't say always, but I would say except for certain five-membered heterocycles okay. that it's coupling okay. with, or if you're making triarial amines, then it's usually faster it's usually not rate limiting, so it's usually fast okay. enough. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And one one more question: What is the important role the weak coordination, weak coordination dial phosphine? So. Okay. The coordination mm -hmm. is, is probably it helps it helps things stay bound. So let's say if the strong coordination comes off and it's still bound weakly, the strong coordination can come back on. So it just mm -hmm. helps to stabilize it. So if it were too strong. You can do two strong groups, mm -hmm. and those work well sometimes too. But it turns out the all the steps are faster if there's only one group bound to the palladium. So that's why you want to have this be able to come off, and mm -hmm. so the substrate can come in, mm -hmm. right? So you want a group that binds so that it keeps things solubilized and from decomposing, but not binding too tightly. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So, yeah, congratulations again. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, Professor Jimmy Ito in the hall. Ah, hi. I can't hear your question. Yeah, the mic's not on. Excuse me. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Con Congratulations for some awarding uh, Suzuki uh, award, uh, Steve. So uh, I have a question for the, maybe you already uh, developed a very nice ligand, uh, including uh, some red holes and X holes, S holes. Uh, yeah, our group is also very uh, love to use such ligands. So, and my question is, how many trials you did to develop your new ligand? Well, my, my question is, uh, some, you already many uh, tr uh, synthesized uh, uh, potential ligand. Right. How, so, so how, for example, how many, how many ligands you tried? I think we probably made a thousand is my guess. <laughs> Okay. But it's they're, they're, you make them all in one or two steps, so it's not as bad as it seems. And it's over the course of 20 years also, right? So it's, um, but, you know, I, I think what we try to do is look at reactions that are of interest to other people and to us. And then find one, ones that are particularly interesting that don't, where the reactions don't work well and then try to understand, think about mechanistically what might be the reason that they don't work mm -hmm. and try to design things. So we do that. And then we also don't want to think of ourselves as being too clever. So we also go back and screen some of our existing ligands. I and mean, we don't screen all a thousand, we don't even have all a thousand, but you know, we probably have a hundred. I don't even know how many we have. We probably have a hundred ligands or something like that. Um, in the lab, and they're stable forever, so it, you know it, 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 it's not a problem. But it's been a lot of lot of work, and some are easy to make, and some are hard to make. So, okay, thank you very much. And thank you. Um, our institute is just uh, uh, aiming uh, some maybe rational design by using the computer, uh, maybe some DFT calculations or FIL. And do you think? Uh, are there any some possibility to some kind of rational computer assisted design for the, for the future uh, transition metal ligand, like uh, maybe next generation of uh, backward ligand? Well, I hope it's not the next generation of Buckwell ligands, but I would say that, yes, I absolutely believe that, um, that this is being done. I mean, there's been 
you know, I mean, we're also working on that and, and people around the world are working on, on trying to do that. It's, I mean, I, I would say one of the challenges is, you know, for, particularly for, for different reactions, but CN coupling in particular is that when you look at the different nucleophiles, so a primary aliphatic amine versus an aniline versus an amide versus uh, a pyrazole, then the coordination chemistry is different in each case. So, and what's going to be the rate limiting step is different in each case. So, having the one magic ligand that will work for everything, I think, is is challenging. So, but what we're working. Um, I have a number of collaborations. Um, you know, one of which is to use m machine learning and AI to to be able to predict you know, give people a better sense of how to predict how to do reactions, right? Particularly this is with a pharmaceutical company and that's particularly, you know, where all drug discovery, you know, getting it to work the first time, that's what people want, right? So. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ito. So thank you for a nice discussion. And uh, Professor Bakbar, Steve, Steve. Well, uh, thank you for answering questions. Okay, uh, I think it's time to close uh, this lecture by uh, Professor Bakbar. Uh, finally, please join me to thank uh, Professor Bakbar for very nice, exciting lecture. And thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you.